Hey there, I'm Annie Dickerson, and on today's episode of the Life and Money Show, we've got a really special treat for you. This was one that I've been looking forward to quite some time. So on this show, um, our special guest, his name is Tyler Thompson. I met Tyler uh, not that long ago um, during my 40th birthday celebration at Miraval, Arizona, which is a wellness resort in Tucson. And I had been drawn to the resort because of their equine experience, also known as horse therapy. And um, I had seen, I don't know if you've seen the, um, the movie 28 Days with Sandra Bullock. I saw it years ago, I think as a teenager. And he, um, she goes to rehab. And as part of her experience at the beginning, um, at least this is what my memory says. Um, at the beginning, she um, goes to her task is to go and try to um, lift the horse's hoof. And the idea is that you have to be fully present for the horse to trust you and to know what you're asking them to do. And so at the beginning of her, her journey, she tries to do it and she can't do it. And she's all like, ah, this is all the horse's fault. The world's against me. You know, I'm sure we've all been in that place. And so then she goes through her recovery journey. And then by the end, as she's leaving, she goes to do it one more time. And lo and behold, now that she's gone through all of that work on herself, she goes and the horse picks up its hoof. And so I had seen that um, as a young person, and I thought, oh, I want to try that someday, see if I can do that too. And um, so I had found out through a friend um, who had gone to Miraval that they had this, this um, equine experience. And so I brought all my friends. These are friends, five of my closest friends from college whom I had known for you know over 20 years. And so I wanted to take them so that we could experience this for the first time. And this is where we met Tyler because he was our guide. Tyler Thompson, who is the equine facilitator and supervisor at Miraval, Arizona, and he's also a certified life coach. He's a very unassuming guy. He shows up with a cowboy hat, of course, and he gives us a ride over to the ranch. And then he um, becomes our leader, our guide, our facilitator for this whole experience. And when I tell you it's a life-changing experience, it is no understatement. It really changed so much not only for me, but our whole friend group, we started to unearth some things, some truths that we haven't really had the, the chance or the space to say, even in 20 years of friendship, you know, you know how it is, you get together with friends, and you catch up on spouses and travel and kids and, you know, the kind of the surface level stuff, but you don't have really the space to say the deep, uncomfortable, hard truths like, I feel like I'm I'm outgrowing this group or I feel like I'm not I'm not getting what I need out of this group or I feel like I'm being pigeonholed in a certain way or you know any number of things that maybe you're holding inside that you don't have the space to say because you don't want to alienate yourself from the group you don't want to offend people but this gave us a safe space um, to share a lot of those things um, and to really unearth a lot of those things, some things that we hadn't really come to come to terms with ourselves. Um, and so it was a very powerful experience. And so I invited Tyler here because I've been telling this story of my experience um, with uh, work with Tater Tot. Um, I've been telling this story to everybody that I know because it, like I said, it changed my life. Um, and during the experience, and I'll, I share this, the full story in this conversation, but as part of the, um, the unlock for me during this session with Tyler and Tater Tot was Tyler suggested that I approach the horse after first um, failing to lift the hoof. Um, but then he suggested that maybe I do it, it with a little bit more playfulness. 
And if you listen to the last episode featuring Jen Briggs, where we talked about the masculine and feminine energies, and that's also what I've been exploring. I recently was on, a, on retreat in Tulum, and we did big work, moving big emotions and big energies and really getting into the, the feminine and I realized that so much of my life, I'm li I've lived in this distorted, wounded masculine energy where it's all about productivity and go, go, go and create more and do more. And it's okay to be exhausted. Being exhausted is a badge of honor. Keep going. And I've realized I've lived in that energetic for all of my life. And when, when Tyler suggested that I be playful, it got me into a completely different headspace. And all of a sudden I said, I can do this. I know how to be playful. And as I've gone further into the feminine, I've realized that's the feminine energetic is this playfulness, this creativity, this presence. And so that's what I am personally moving into and, and exploring further and diving deeper into. And so it was great that this was such a a meaningful micro moment to show me the the journey that I'm on and the work that um, I need to do for myself. So with all of that being said, um, before we dive into this conversation with Tyler, um, you know, I've always said that community is such an important thing, whether you're, you know, going to a wellness resort, or you're learning to invest, learning to paint anything, you want to be around people who um, are doing the thing that you want to do, or at least, at the very least, are passionate about the same things. And so when I got into when I first got into real estate investing, I sought out as many people as I could who were doing the same thing. And um, once we launched Good Egg Investments and we started to help people to invest in real estate, we decided to put together a community of people to help them to get to know each other and to learn about these opportunities and to invest together. Um, and so if that calls to you, then we invite you to join. It's called the Good Egg Investor Club. And to join, it's completely free. You can just go to goodegginvestments.com slash invest. All right. With that, let's dive into our conversation with Tyler Thompson. Tyler, welcome to the show. How are you? I'm doing well. I'm really excited to be here. I am so excited. I cannot tell you how long I've been waiting to have you on the show. All of my friends who are listening, who have heard me talk about our equine experience, our horse therapy experience at Miraval, they're like, they're so excited for this episode because um, it was just a life-changing experience for all of us. And I'm definitely, we're going to get into that. But first, I want to jump into a little bit of your story and how you got to where you are, because I know that you weren't always like you had been taught earlier on a different way to be with horses and to work with horses. But there was a certain moment in your journey that really opened your eyes and changed everything for you and led you down this different path that you never expected, which then led you to where you are now. So take us to that moment. Tell us a little bit about how you got to where you are today. That's right. So I was working at a dude ranch at that time and everything I'd been taught was, you know, you just kind of make the horse do it. Um, you, you never really thought of the horses and I never questioned that. It's kind of what everyone around me was doing. It was very um, normal at that point. And it wasn't until about a year into that job, a new guy started. I remember everyone telling me he's a jerk. Don't listen to him. You know, he's going to yell at you and tell you you're doing everything wrong. Just just ignore him and walk away. And these were you know, friends of mine at the time. So for about two weeks, I'd hear him yelling and, you know, asking about different questions. Who's done this? Who's done that? And there was a day that he was yelling about whose horse is this? There was a couple of bleeps in there. <laughs> and it was my horse. Um, and this this was that moment where I was like, do I just walk away? Had there was almost like a defensiveness on my part where I was, I was wanting to step up and I told him, you know, that's my horse. And he, he asked me, do you know what you're doing? I said, I think you're about to tell me I don't. 
And he's like, you're right, you don't. <laughs> there was a knot that you tie on the horse's halter. There's a very specific knot you tie. And I just tied an ordinary knot. I didn't know any different. And he had told me, he's like, look, you tied this knot. The horse has pulled it. It's now super tight and I can't undo it. Now I've got to take a knife to the horse's face to cut this off. And I don't like doing that. And this really changed my perspective of him. This wasn't necessarily a jerk. It sounded like he actually really cared about the horses. So that's when I was more open and curious, like, okay, tell me more about this. He showed me how to tie the simple knot. And that was the moment everything changed. I knew this guy actually knew what he was talking about and was willing to teach me. So I, I spent some time with him and he taught me about natural horsemanship. You can ask the horse to do things. You don't have to force them. Isn't that interesting that there's just so I'm thinking about all the people in my life that I've made assumptions about that I thought they were a certain way for a certain reason, whatever story I was telling myself about who they were, or what they were after, what they needed from me. And that precluded me from getting really getting to know who they were and what they really were about. And it sounds like in this case, even though you it was maybe unintentional at the time, but you were open enough, first of all, you had the courage to step up and take ownership. That's the first piece. Not everybody would have done that. Somebody, somebody else in your shoes might have just said, I don't know what he's yelling about. I'm yeah. just gonna go over <laughs> here and pretend I don't hear anything. Um, but you owned up to it and you said, that's, that's my horse. I tied that knot. And in listening and being open, you realized that your assumptions or maybe the assumptions of your friends that had been passed on to you were completely different from his motivations and what was driving him, which yeah. is such a great lesson for all of us. Truly, because it wasn't even my experience of him. It was everybody else's. And yeah. We can take those experiences on. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And so and I, you, oh, go ahead. I was going to say, I like that you call it uh, courage, <laughs> you mm. know, to step up and take that accountability. Because at the time, that wasn't necessarily what yeah. I was thinking. <laughs> but looking back, yeah, I agree. Yeah. I mean, to, to go up to somebody who's yelling and, and clearly upset about something, who has a track record and a reputation, and to put yourself in that situation and own up to it, whatever consequence may come from it. I mean, I think that's that's huge courage. And so it led you to this then um, introduction or curiosity about natural horsemanship. So tell us a little bit about that. What does that mean? And, and how has that gotten you to where you are now? Yeah. So natural horsemanship, to me at least, means, you know, we're, we're looking at the horse's perspective of things as well, right? How are they responding to us? And what is it that we are doing? It's not just solely focused on, you know, the horse being stubborn or resisting. Maybe I don't know what I'm saying and I need to say it in a different way. So I like to think of it, it's more about asking rather than telling and demanding, which is more the common uh, theme with horses. Yeah. And yeah. why horses? I mean, how uh, there are lots of animals that you could work with as, you know, for animal therapy, I guess. But what's so special about horses? It's a great question. So there's a lot of different things about horses. Um, one of them being they're prey animals, right? So they're not like your average cat or dog that people want to associate them with. You know, they're a herd animal. They're a social animal. They really need connection, right? That's how they feel safest together. Um, so I think that's part of the dynamic we can really relate to. We're also social creatures, right? We now in our society can, for the most part, survive on our own. Back in the day, we used to live in villages, right? We needed each other. So I think it can really bring us back to those roots, right? They're very intuitive. They're very sensitive beings. Um, something, you know, I've always really thought of myself as as well, intuitive and sensitive, uh, for the better or worse. <laughs> and horses also have a way of co-regulating, right? They're, when they get upset, when they are freaked out, they'll actually rely on each other to bring themselves back to a neutral state. So hmm. just being mm -hmm. around them and as long as we're present, we can actually have some natural therapeutic moments. And we'll sync up heart rates and their heart rate is about 30 beats per minute. So just being around oh, them wow. can naturally lower our heart rate. 
That's a mm. little bit of the Heart Math Institute studies, if you haven't heard mm. of them before. Yeah. Were you always um, drawn to horses, even as a kid? Or did this come yeah. later in your path? <laughs> it came later in my path. Okay. Uh, I was actually very scared of horses. <laughs> ah, yeah. interesting. I mean, they're uh, very big creatures. Yes, <laughs> they are. And powerful, as most know. Yes. Unpredictable or uncontrollable. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Those are some of the themes I hear a lot of, you know, fear around the horses. Yeah. Which oftentimes isn't actually about the horses. It might be more about mm -hmm. our experience with those things in life. So yeah. I had a fear of horses. I would you know, been in the Boy Scouts, so I had ridden a couple of times, but I remember just kind of going through the motions of it, just sitting there. <laughs> Didn't really enjoy it. I even remember my mom asking, do you want to go to this horse camp? I was like, no, that sounds awful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Funny enough, I ended up running a horse camp <laughs> for That's kids so later on. Well, how did that happen? I mean, I, was there a turning point where all of a sudden you had experience with horses and, that you enjoyed more? Or how did you overcome that fear? Sort of. There was a, a stair-stepping moment. Um, so I'll kind of jump back here if that's all right. And I was, yeah. you know, I think I told you I was working towards moving into real estate, being a real estate agent. And this really wasn't my calling. Um, I remember a lot of resistance to it. I was just kind of, again, going through the motions of life. And there was a, a breakup that kind of involved this pivotal moment for me that I asked myself, what do I want out of life? And the answer at the time came like electric through my body. I was, I want to have fun. I want to be happy. Mm. I want to enjoy where I spend my time every day. So I didn't really have an idea for what that looked like, but I just went online. I started looking at different opportunities and what stood out to me was a uh, wild West stunt performer auditions. <laughs> <laughs> it was totally different. You knew it was not real estate though. That was the one you were like, <laughs> Hmm, uh, there's a reason I'm asking this question. And so it's not what it was right in front of me. And wow, that's so fascinating so you searched and you were looking at I mean, you must have been looking at all sorts of different things to come across right. wild west stunt performer <laughs> yeah it was not something i had ever looked into i didn't even know, yeah. know that was much of a thing like I, I grew up going to old tucson here in, in arizona and mm. you know my mom actually reminded me that when i was about five or six years old i told her i want to be a cowboy someday because Ah, the idea of, of what cowboys did. They jumped off buildings, yep. fist fights, <laughs> gunfights. Um, and so I had, again, that electric shock through my body. As soon as I saw the title, mm. just the tug pulled me towards it. So I listened. Yeah. I just went up to the audition. I had absolutely no experience with it. I was athletic, so I was like, I could just get by. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and lo and behold, I got the part. I I spent wow. about a year jumping off buildings and rolling downstairs. No way. Yeah. Wow. So That's crazy. That, that was like the first passion I really had. Yeah. I thought I was actually going to follow that path. Yeah. I go to stunt school. I wanted to move to Hollywood, get into the movies. That was the mm -hmm. idea at the time. Um, and then I had a bad fall and that led me to find out I had scoliosis. So mm. there was that pivotal moment again. I was like, I've got to rethink what I'm doing, but I know I still want to have fun. I want to be happy and enjoy where I spend my time. Back online. <laughs> and I found yeah. a, a summer job in Mexico. Uh huh. That summer job is where I met horses. Um, uh -huh. I was going for the, the natural part, the hiking, the kayaking, the fishing, and they did horseback riding. So oh. I spent so a wait. summer. You didn't even, so when you were working as a stunt performer, you didn't, you didn't work with horses at no, that point. It was uh -huh. all on the ground. Gotcha. Yeah. So that's what, what allowed you to get into it. You weren't like, I'm going after horses first round. You were like, oh, I think I can jump off buildings. That seems fun. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. It was an like, adrenaline okay. factor. If you right. Will. <laughs> Have you seen that movie, um, Fall Guy with Brian Gosling? I haven't, but I want to. Oh, you should add it to your list. It's pretty I'm great. Mad. I mean, it's all about the stunt world which is fascinating you never really get to learn about that you know you just yeah. see the the front end of the the films but anyway um so you have a fall so talk 
tell us a little bit about that moment because okay. I'm sure at the point you were envisioning, okay, I've got this future. I've, I've yeah. you're planning out like, okay, well, I like this. I'm having fun. It's meeting my criteria. So next step is to go to stunt school. Next step is to apply for this and that. And then you have a fall and then which leads to you discovering that you have scoliosis. That must have been a devastating moment. It really was actually. Um because a friend of mine at the stunt show, him and I were looking at apartments to move in together and, and move to California. Mm. So we were really pushing this. Um, and then after falling on my neck, cause that's, that's what happened. I <gasps> fell from the Oof. building onto my neck and it was in the middle of a show and I had to get up and be like, I survived. And I remember being like, oh right? my God, I really did survive. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I remember just laying in bed with the ice pack, uh, after oh. I'd seen the chiropractor and yeah. he told me, you really need to rethink what you're doing. You're damaging your body. And mm -hmm. I'm not going to tell you not to do it, but if you want to have any kind of valuable uh, life left, take a second guess. Yikes. So I, I remember being really upset and I remember talking to my stunt director at the time and, and telling him, look, I, I can't keep doing this. Um, you know, I got to do some like light duty stuff where I wasn't actually in the show anymore. I was kind of more behind the scenes. And that's when I, I started looking again. Okay, what am I going to do? Like, this isn't the end. This is just another step. Uh, and that's, that's when I found that job in Mexico. Mm. So my, <laughs> my words to the uh, stunt director at the time were, you know what, I'm going to drop the false cowboy thing. I'm going to go try the real yeah. cowboy. <laughs> <laughs> the real cowboy. Yeah, you know, it, re it reminds me a lot of, um, I don't know if you know the book, The Surrender Experiment by Michael Singer. Mm -hmm. um, he wrote The Untethered Soul. Um, okay, that was yeah. his more famous book. But um, I like The Surrender Experiment better because it's his own personal journey of surrendering to everything. And he's gone through some crazy things himself of things not going his way or um, unexpected twists and turns that have led him to where he is. And it reminds me a lot of your story where you, there were certain points where you were like, wait, this isn't quite right. But you didn't really know. You just opened it up. So to give room for the universe to come yeah. in and co-create with you. And I think that's where so many people shut down. They say, well, this isn't working, but I'm going to force it to work, or I'm going to choose something else that is close. But you kind of opened it up in more than one occasion to really just see what would come in. Um, and that's where the magic really happens. Yeah. And I, I think that's spot on because being open, that was my big thing. I have no idea yeah. where I'm going. I'm yeah. just going to follow these tugs that I feel like yes. it worked thus far. Why am I going to question it? Yeah, exactly. So you go to Mexico and you're yep. going for the nature and the, the boating and the fishing and the hiking and whatever. And you realize there's horses there. And so at this point, were you still having jumped off of buildings and whatnot? Were you still kind of fearful of horses? Or at this point, were you like, no, give me that horse. Let me get on that horse. <laughs> this is actually where I realized I had my fear of horses again. Oh, uh, okay. I had totally forgotten about that until uh -huh. we get there. And the other guide that's there is, is helping me learn about, you know, how do you bridle a horse? How do you put a saddle on? And I remember going to put the bridle in the horse's mouth and I was shaking. I was so scared mm -hmm. it was going to bite me. I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't want to lose a finger. <laughs> and so yeah. This is the part that, that goes the in the mouth and, and right. attaches to the part behind the head. Okay. Exactly. Okay. And so that was the moment it all came flooding back. I was like, oh my God, I'm afraid of horses. I forgot about that. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And then the next eight hours we had to spend on that horse was going through the canyons. So hundreds of feet up, hundreds of feet wow. down. It was terrifying. And that's where I learned I have to trust the horse. I, mm. I don't know what I'm doing, but the horse does. And I don't want to fall and neither does this horse. So I just knew I'm going to keep my balance. I'm not going to restrict this horse by any means. I was in a very as you would say, beginner's mind place of it's okay not to know what I'm doing. I'm just going to experience this. And that little horse led me everywhere safely. <laughs> um, I, I fell in love with this little horse. His name was Tesoro. And he oh. certainly was a treasure. 
Mm. So that's, that's when I knew, like, I actually, I kind of like horses, even though I don't know what I'm doing and, and the guide doesn't speak English, nor did <laughs> I speak Spanish. <laughs> I, I, that's when I was like, okay, I want to work with horses. Oh, wow. What a 180. I mean, yeah. first of all, for you to remember that fear of horses and then to still go anyway, to follow through with it. And this sounds like quite an immersive experience too. Not just like, yeah. we're going to ride through the park and come right back. This no. is like <laughs> many hours uh, and a quite harrowing journey, I imagine. It was. Um, but it sounds like you part of part of it was probably you had no choice but to trust the horse That's you right. had to and you had literally all of your other resources the language too the location this experience you had nothing except your trust in this horse That's and exactly so right. it sounds like it was kind of a perfect experience for that it really was and like you said you know moving towards that fear rather than away from um, yeah, especially being, you know, I'm kind of hired by this place. Can't really be like, you know, the horse thing's just not for me. Yeah. 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 So let's fast forward to now and what you t tell us. I mean, I have my own experience, but um, for the listener, give us a kind of an overview of what you do now with horses, because I know it's not riding horses as some of my friends thought when I brought them, <laughs> yeah. um, but how do you work with horses and with people? So we have a lot of different activities that we do with people um, from cleaning their feet to walking them around the corrals to eat what's called round penning, where you're moving the horse without touching them. That's how we exercise them. And so the emphasis is not on the activity. It's, it's not on the horse. It's on how you show up to it, how you advocate for your own wants and needs. You know, how do we not attach ourselves to the expectations of who we are, or what we should be able to do? Um, very much, like you said, that open place of possibility. So with working with the horses, a lot of different things come up. And a lot of the times it's, it's emotional stuff from the past. So... We're having people pay attention to what they think, how they feel, and how these two things are coming together to create their behavior and their reality, right? As we kind of talked about earlier, a lot of the fear around horses, that unpredictability, the out of control, that's not their first time experiencing that. Somewhere in their life, they've experienced that and learned to fear that. And that's what's coming in and, and distorting the interaction with the horses. It's, it's changing how we communicate. It's changing how we you know, relate. It's changing everything. You know, from the moments where we think the horse is stubborn or it doesn't like us because it's not working with us. Maybe that's true. Maybe it's not. But if that's what we're perceiving, that's, mm -hmm. again, it's, it's changing everything. So when yeah. we start to question those patterns and, you know, where have we learned these things, everything seems different. Even though the horse didn't change, nothing really changed externally. Everything changed internally. So it's a big yeah. shift in focus from the external to the internal. You know, what's mm. going on for them? No. What's going on for me? And that's, that's something I think we've been tuned out of. Yeah. So I just want to set the stage for the listener of um, what my experience was um, with this equine experience that we had with you. Um, because I, it's not an overstatement to say that it changed my life. It's still, I can drop right back into that moment. And I remember what transpired and not only for me, but for my friends as well. And so, um, for the listener, this was for my 40th birthday, not that long ago. And I decided I wanted to invite my five closest friends, uh, from college to Miraval in Tucson. And little did we know that we were going to have a, this life-changing experience with Tyler. And part of why I was drawn to Miraval was because of this equine experience um, that I had heard about. And so I wanted to bring um, all my friends to experience it with me because I had never done it before. Um, but I didn't tell them very much about it. Um, so they didn't know they were like, do we need to wear long pants? Are we going to be riding the horses? And so I kept it very open-ended. And so I thought it was really, it was amusing to me at least. So we're walking up um, 
to the uh would you call it an arena or a corral the yeah that's a round pen yeah okay the round pen um and I remember we were walking up and there were some benches along the side where my friends and I were going to sit while you gave the orientation and introduced us to the horse. And we're walking in and um, grabbing our seats and my friends noticed there's boxes of tissues. And they're like, huh, what are these tissues for? And I'm like, oh yeah, it's about to get real. Um, and you know, I, I don't think they really realized what we were going to experience, but what transpired over the following couple of hours, um, I think it it opened up a completely new chapter in our friendship together. These are friends that I had known for over 20 years. And some of the things that came out through this experience um, were things that we hadn't had a chance to say to each other or to really confront within ourselves. In probably five, 10 years or more um, that we were able to really sync up on and have the place and the courage to share with each other. Um, and so I'm, I'm going to just share my, for, my experience first, and I want you to weigh in because I've told okay. the story now many times, but I didn't have your perspective. And so I want you to add in your, what you remember. I know you do these all the time. <laughs> yes. I'm sure there's, um, there's patterns, there's common patterns that you can uh, t bring in. So because it was my birthday, I volunteered to go first. So I stepped into the pen uh, with you and the horse, uh, whose name I think was Tater Tot. Is that right? That's right. Tater Tot the horse. Ah, oh, we'll always have a special place in our heart for him. Um, Anyway, so we, I stepped into the pen um, and I remember thinking as I stepped in, I was like, okay, well, I've seen this before in a movie and I'm just going to do, I'm interested in the one where I try to pick up the horse's hoof and I'm just going to pick that one and I'm going to walk up to the horse and I'm going to do it. And he already showed us the steps. So I'm going to probably be able to do it. And I'm pretty good at most things. So I'm going to do it. And it's probably going to work for me first time. And my friends might have trouble, but I'm going to probably be able to do it. And so I step into the ring and um, what blew me away was first, before we even approached the horse, um, you just, you have this natural way about you where you just, I think you just naturally without even thinking about it, kind of disarm people. And so you're just like, how's it going? How are you feeling? And maybe because of that, um, that place we were in and how open we all were, it's like, you know what? I, I'm kind of feeling nervous. And normally I wouldn't say that. I would say, I'm feeling great. I'm so excited to do this thing. But for whatever reason, I felt I could be a little bit more vulnerable. And so I said, you know, I'm kind of feeling nervous. And you said, great. Well, where do you feel that in your body? And it was, it was, a. Uh, it took me some time to realize where I was feeling it in my body. And even this, I feel like you had an intuitive hit about because at first um, I said it was kind of in my solar plexus region. That's right. And you didn't stop there. You said, well, where else do you feel it? And I said, kind of in my, my throat area. And I don't know how you knew it, but that's the, my throat chakra is the area that I, have always had trouble with my entire life. So you kind of left the solar plexus and you were like, let's focus on the throat. And I, throughout the whole experience, you just, you seem to have these intuitive knowings and within, I don't even know what questions you asked, but within five minutes or so, I remember I was totally breaking down crying and all my friends were crying and I was like I just feel like I always have to have it together and it's so exhausting and it was just I mean within just a few minutes I was able to and this was even before getting to the horse I didn't even touch the horse yet at this point um so I mean share share with us a little bit about your perspective of you know because 
it's really, and I know you've said this and your mentor's book from Wyatt Webb, um, it's not about the horse. It's not about the horse is what we've learned. So tell us a little bit, what's your take on that scenario or just in general when people approach the ring and what they expect versus what actually transpires? Uh, that's a good question because a lot of the times, you know, when I first meet people, they're like, oh, it's just a cowboy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and they don't expect because yeah. randomly, you know, 50 word description doesn't leave a lot of room for yeah. <laughs> knowing. <laughs> Yep. And truthfully, I don't know what to expect either. I don't know mm. what you're going to bring to this. I don't know how open you're going to be. So I have to meet people where they are. I, I know I can't pull them to my expectation of this is what you're going to do. And so I do remember you actually came in very intentional that you wanted to be vulnerable. You wanted to be open. That was the whole reason you were there at Miraval. And so I think that allowed for everybody else to also feel the same way, whether you mm. want to, um, say it was a space or not, there was something in you that allowed for that. So I want to acknowledge mm. that part first. Yeah. And a lot of the times we're disconnected from our body and that's where our, our feelings, that's where our emotions happen. So when we get in touch, you know, typically, yeah, it's going to be in the gut, it's going to be in the chest, but I can hear emotion coming up and it gets stuck right here when we're trying to push it down. We're trying to keep it together as you said mm -hmm. that's why i would always say keeping your shit together looks like being buried yeah. up to your neck in it <laughs> <laughs> and that's the truth because this is where we've closed down our voice we don't want to express what's happening and you can just hear <clears throat> the words start to get clenched mm -hmm. yeah so that led me to ask well there's a little bit more than what's being presented like mm. you're, you're being pretty vulnerable but i'm going to give you a little gentle nudge and yeah you went straight to it and he started opening up. And like you said, the tears, the, the breakthrough, I'll call it, mm -hmm. started to happen. Um, so I, I think that's the most important thing is, is just simply being present, connected to myself, connected to you in that moment, and not necessarily buying absolutely everything that you say in that moment. Mm -hmm. But that must have taken, and maybe here you can share with us a little bit of you know, when you decided to work with horses in this way, how you got from stuntman to riding that horse that first time in the canyon to where you are now, because I know this doesn't happen by accident. This being able to be so present with the person who's right there in front of you, that takes a lot of work on yourself as well as training and practice. And so as you got into this, first of all, how did you discover that that was something you were interested in? And then how did you then start to do that work on yourself and for others to get to this point? Yeah, so a lot of it came from Wyatt Webb. Um, mm -hmm. When I landed my job at Miraval, I was simply there to learn to work with horses in a different way. I actually didn't even know what the program really involved. Uh, in fact, at the time we were doing trail rides. And so at that time, I think I was hired more as like the guy who could get the stuff done, who could take out the trail rides. Um, and Wyatt was going through some health issues at the time. He was you know, 76, 75 years old. And uh, they needed somebody to be able to get him water, get his people, grab his horse, do the safety demonstrations. And at the time, nobody really wanted to do it. They'd all been there for many years. You know, they had heard the whole song and dance. Um, so I just took on the opportunity. I sat in on his classes. And I remember the first class being like, this is amazing. Watching 10 to 12 people that didn't know each other open up and connect on a deeper level than maybe they had experienced in all their life. I mean, it was beautiful. And I knew, okay, there is something more to this. And all of the lessons that everybody would either learn about themselves or that Wyatt would talk about, it spoke to me. And so that's where I started looking at myself a little more. <laughs> like I always like to say, you know, I thought I went to Miraval to learn about horses and yeah, I went to Miraval to learn about myself. Yeah. Um, so that kind of sparked this. I want to learn more. Mm. And from that moment on for the next three years while Wyatt was still there, I sit in, sat in on his classes three times a week. 
where it was Tuesdays, Fridays, and Saturdays. I was like, these are the three days I want to work. I will take his class. And I, I remember he would stay after for a little bit and he would let me just ask questions and pick his brain and be like, how did you see this? And where did you get that? And you know, what books do you recommend? And he was very open and honest with me. Um, yeah. And we created a really, really strong connection. So that led me during COVID to actually seek out being certified as a life coach. Um, I wanted uh, at that time I felt like I didn't have enough you know, certifications, qualifications. Mm -hmm. There was a little of my own securities at the time. Mm -hmm. And I remember everything that they taught in the class had already been taught to me. And mm. I was actually really good at all of it thus far. Uh, so it just reinforced everything why it taught me. And that yeah. continues to follow in each book mm -hmm. that I read or each course that I take. Uh, it just gives me a different way to talk about it. So yeah. I just, I fell in love with the kind of like what you experienced, the, the vulnerability that everybody offered mm. me, which I had yeah. always seen as a weakness in myself. Yeah. Yeah. I'm curious, are there like, you do this almost every day. You work with groups of people and horses. And are there certain people who are not right for these sorts of experiences who come in and for whatever reason, you're not able to break through or get there with them? Oh, yeah. Um, especially because either they weren't expecting it um, mm. or they're just simply not able to. So I wouldn't say that they're not a good fit for it. Because even mm -hmm. if they themselves don't open up to it, there's a good chance they're going to pick up something from somebody else. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. I would say it's it's great for anybody. But I never want to push somebody into the red zone. I think yeah. I might have said this in the class. I'm not here to throw you off a cliff. I'm here to jump. With right. <laughs> yeah. So that part's up to you. There's no judgment about that. You yeah. Know, give the horse a hug and get a picture for Instagram. Mm -hmm. Cool. <laughs> I'll take some angles for you. Yeah. But at the end of the day, this is this is up to you. Right. Yeah. And that's something, yeah. again, I, I had to learn because in the beginning, of course, having those experiences with people can really inflate the ego, can oh, really yeah. add validation mm -hmm. to who I am and what I do. Yeah. And I really had to look at that. Why yeah. am I, you know, in some ways pushing people to have those experiences so mm. I can feel better? And yeah. having that agenda it made all the difference in the world. So yeah. it's been a lot of growth through the last seven years. I can imagine. I mean, I've coached some people as well in the past in teaching them to do what we do as far as raising capital for real estate syndications. And when I've stepped into that coach seat, oh my goodness, so much of my own stuff comes up for me, even though the stuff that I'm teaching them, I've done over and over again. And I know the nuts and bolts of it, but the stories around, am I being of value? What are they getting out of this? What are they thinking about when I'm teaching them, the way that I'm teaching them? All of that comes up, which is why it's so, it was so refreshing that you were so present. And it was very clear to all of us that you didn't have an agenda. And you were just there to be there with us and where, whatever we wanted to make out of that experience. Um, and so speaking of which, okay, so I had my breakdown moment where I was like, oh, I feel like I have to have everything all together. And then we made it through that. And then it was finally time for me to approach Tater Tot. And I remember there were three different um, things that we could choose to do with the horse. One was brush the horse. One was to walk the horse around the pen. And the other was the one that I wanted to do, which was to pick up one of the hoofs, hoofs and um, to clean the bottom. Yeah. And so that was the one I chose. And of course, so this is my thinking back on it. And I've told this story now many times. This is my the experience that I had. Okay, it's time now. Okay, I'm going to go. And I remember Tyler told us, step one, do this. Step two, step three, step four. And I'm mentally rehearsing it as I'm walking up to the horse. And I'm like, I've got this. All my friends are watching. And I'm like, I can do this. No problem. And I was so zoned in. I just, I didn't bother looking at anything else in the environment. I, 
I just, I didn't think about maybe the horse can move or come to me. I didn't think about any of that. And I went to go try to pick up, um, I think it was a front hoof that first try. And I bent down, I squeezed where you had showed us, nothing happened. I'm like, okay, that's okay. That was my first try. I'm going to try it again. I'm like going through the steps again. I'm like, okay, I'm going to try again. Squeeze a little harder this time. Still nothing. And now I'm like, oh, now I'm looking like an idiot in front of my friends. Okay, I'm going to give it one more try. And I tried it again. Not even a slight budge. Nothing. And so I remembered you had said you weren't going to help us unless we asked for help. Yeah. So because you didn't want to interfere with our experience and you wanted us to to make it what we wanted. And so at this point, and I normally wouldn't ask for help, I would just keep going until I could figure it out. But I thought, okay, I, I, I'm out of ideas. So I'm just going to ask for help. So I asked you for help and it was two, I, and I would definitely want to hear your perspective on this, but two things that I remember. One was first you pointed out that there was literally a pile of poop sitting right next to where I was standing that I hadn't even noticed. I hadn't even noticed that that was in my way. And I had wedged myself in this tight little spot between the pile of poop and the horse. And so obviously I didn't in that I, I wasn't taking care of myself and I wasn't really noticing the environment. And then plus, then you said, well, who could we get to, to clean this up? And I looked around and I said, well, my friend, Monica, she's in the pen with me. Let's get her to clean it up. <laughs> and you were like, okay, yes, Monica can clean it. Who else can clean it? And I said, well, I guess I could clean it. I mean, I don't really want to, but I could. Um, and then you paused and you said, well, what about me? Why didn't you ask me to clean it up? And it was this moment where I was like, oh yeah, Tyler works here. He has experience with horses. Clearly I could have asked him, but it was a micro moment that showed me how I, I mean, just like, it's not about the horse. It's about your relationships with people. Right. Yeah. And it showed me wow, when I think about delegating or asking somebody else, what are those stories that I'm telling myself about Tyler's somebody in authority? I couldn't possibly yeah. ask him. Oh, I'd ask anybody else before I ask somebody um, who I perceive to be higher up than me. So that was a, a big unlock for me. Um, and then I, and then after that, you you made a very simple suggestion. You said, well, why don't you try it again? But this time, you know, don't try to be so serious. Because I I remember after the, the poop was cleaned up, there was a series of questions. And you always brought such benign questions. <laughs> but they led to such, you know, such profound breakthroughs. Um, because I remember... Um, you asked me something around the lines of how it felt. Um, I think it, you asked me how it, it felt for me that the horse didn't lift its hoof. And I, I was like, you know, I, I kind of thought I would be a natural. And you said, well, that's not a feeling. That's a thought. And it took me multiple rounds for me to even access the feeling of the sadness and the grief of having to let go of this moment and it playing out very differently than I thought it would. And so after that, you, you suggested that I just be playful. And it was such a, I was like, oh, playful. I could do that. I'm a playful person. And it took all the pressure off and so I went up to the horse again and I picked the the hind leg this time and I tried it again. But it, if you remember, Tater Tot didn't lift its, his hoof the whole way, just the 
the, just the bottom of the hoof. And I was like, well, this isn't quite all the way, but let me give it one more try. So I walked all the way over to his head and I was like, come on, buddy. It's just you and me. We're just playing here. Let's just see. And of course he doesn't care. He has no idea what's gotten, you know, and he has no idea what I'm saying. His energy is exactly the same, but what changed was my energy. Yeah. And so I went back one last time, barely touched him, and his hoof popped right up. And so it was those, I mean, in that simple interaction, it just opened so much for me. So I don't know, I'd love to hear your thoughts, your perspectives, anything you want to add to that. Yeah, so it's one of my favorite sayings, and I don't remember who I heard this from. But it was talking about, you know, all as a kid, all of your growth happens through play. Mm. Right? You're on the playground. There's no anxiety to it. There's no yeah. agenda. You're just playing yeah. for the sake of playing. But at some point, life obligations kick in, the responsibilities, the expectations, and you leave the playground and you enter a battleground or a proving ground. <laughs> and yes. that was like, wow, yes. Let's get back to the playground. Yeah, where it doesn't matter whether the hoof comes up or not. I'm having fun with yeah. this nonetheless. Mm -hmm. So I think for myself, my own perspective, that first time you went in, there might have still been a little bit of expectation, like getting mm -hmm. this hoof up. Oh, yeah. <laughs> versus that second time you're like, you know what? We're just here to play. And it just popped right up. Yeah. Uh, and it's it's not uncommon for people to not want to ask me for help. I don't know mm -hmm. how many times, you know, we finally get to that point because you were good about asking for help. Not everybody is. They forget mm. that's an option that I even said mm. I'll be there to help. They'll go to ask somebody who has no clue what they're doing. <laughs> they'll be like, hey, what could I do? And they're like, I don't know. I've never done this. <laughs> or same thing with the poop. Like they don't want to put somebody else out that they see in authority. Mm -hmm. And again, yeah. these things track back. Yeah. So looking at it, you know, how is that stopping us from asking for help outside of there? What is that saying about who we are when we're not getting what we need or what we should be doing? You know, when we have no help, right? who are we in those moments? Those are really important things to pay attention to. Yeah. So I think it was great that you even asked for help at all. Yeah. Well, thank you. And I'm curious, how did you even, like when I asked you for help, how, I mean, this is the, the, my ego asking okay. this question is, how did you even know what to say? How, how did you know that what you were going to say was going to be the thing that would did. magically unlock it? <laughs> yeah, nope. I never know what question to ask, what's going to be that thing that gets you there. It's, it's part of that being present and intuitive. Mm. I'm just, you're just I a channel, you're an open I, channel. Exactly. Yeah. So that's something I like to think about is like, this isn't me doing this. This isn't like I'm powerful. Mm. It's like, no, this is something yeah. coming through me mm. and I've got to be present to that. Uh, yeah. Definitely ego can get in the way and, and I can tell when I'm not in that present state for whatever the reason, because yeah. nothing is happening. Nothing is working. And I'm in my mm -hmm. head trying to figure out that thing. And now I'm actually in that same hole with you. Uh, so I, I had a colleague ask me, how do you know what questions to ask? I don't. And that's okay. <laughs> and that takes so much work and so much courage to clear your own channel enough to be able to not have to worry about that, to be able to be present. I mean, that I perceive that to be extremely challenging. You make it look very simple. But I'm sure there's a lot that goes into it. <laughs> there is not. I wish I could say I am that present in every area of my life. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a complete human being either. I'm, I'm still in a, a work in progress. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, one more question I wanted to ask you was, you know, we had talked in your story about 
going from stunt guy to um, you then went to Mexico and you explored the outdoors. You kind of overcame your fear of horses and you realized that you wanted to work with horses in a different way. I assume that there's not that many jobs out there for exactly what you were looking for. So how did you end up finding the path to where you are now? Yeah, so went from Mexico to the dude ranch and it was just like a recommendation from a friend at the time I said, Hey, I was a server at this ranch. Like they're always hiring, check it out. And they were, they were always hiring. Um, so I landed that job at the dude ranch really easily, really smoothly. I think I put the application in it and got the call the same day. Um, <laughs> That's a there, dream come true. <laughs> Most know. people are like, no, I'm here for months. Same day. That's great. Uh, I Everybody think that also go says to work about on the place. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah, that's there's a, a reason point. always looking for people. I, yeah. I, I, I um, <laughs> but after having met that guy who, who taught me about natural horsemanship, um, that's when I was like, I can't be at this place anymore. I need to leave. Mm. I didn't have a job lined up. I ended up having to actually move back home because I was living at that ranch. And it was quite an abrupt ending. Um, but it, the friend, a, a whole different friend, was helping me move out of the ranch, and he was telling me about Miraval. He was a chef there. He mm -hmm. said, hey, Miraval has a horse program. Maybe you should check that out. And so I went online. I, I saw the horse program. You know, it looked pretty amazing. And I went online to go find the job application. I couldn't find anything. <laughs> so I just picked up the phone and I called the ranch. Uh, I remember the supervisor, you know, answering the phone and said, Hey, my name's Tyler. I've got a year's worth of horrible horse experience. <laughs> I just found out this could all be different. And I really want to learn to do yeah. this different. A friend of mine said he might be hiring. And she said, that's an interesting story. And, and no, we're not hiring, but I'm curious. Tell me a little more. So I, I told her about my experience mm -hmm. in Mexico and the dude ranch and something in that call inspired her to say, well, come on in for a ride. I'll teach you a couple of things. So impromptu I, I came into the ranch we went out on a trail ride and even in just the first five minutes she taught me so much it blew my mind you can ask the horse to walk with just the tilt of your pelvis and inhale of your breath hmm. it's nothing i'd ever heard so i spent about three hours there we had great conversations she said look i don't i don't have a job to offer you but you know thanks for coming in and two weeks later i get a call from her saying hey i was able to get an on-call position opened up for you. If you're still interested, we'd love to have you. And so I took it and I made myself fully available. My mom's like, you know, you found a dream. You want to chase it. Go ahead. I'll, I'll support you for now. And so any hours that I could get, I would be there. I started just one day, two days here, or there, and slowly worked into a part-time and full-time job. And before you knew it, I became the supervisor of the place. It was <laughs> something I... Wow. I kind of had to create for myself. Yeah. Wow. You kind of um, worked your way up from the the metaphorical mailroom. I mean, you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but you know what strikes me about that story is, you know, you were living in your truth. You knew what you wanted, and you had glimpsed it. You didn't quite know how you were going to get there, but you trusted that somehow, some way, you were going to be able to make it there. And you did everything that you could, um, even though there wasn't a job application, you said, well, I can just call and see. And then you showed up and you learned as much as you could in those few hours. But because you were so authentic and you had such an interesting story because you had, you had followed your dream, your path. And so you had this great story, which I'm sure resonated so deeply with these other people who are also passionate about horses and and so one thing led to another and so here you are but i mean i i fully believe there there are no accidents and it sounds like everything that transpired in your path happened for a reason from the you know real estate agent to stunt guy <laughs> to scoliosis to dude ranch to the guy yelling at you about the knot to now miraval and all the people you're able to um to meet and to impact um and one more question i have for you before we move into the life and money round money show spotlight round yeah. um 
if somebody's listening to this and they're like, you know, I, I don't know if I can get out to Tucson to work with the horses. Is there another way that they could work with you if they were interested? Yeah. So I do virtual stuff, uh, obviously without horses. Um, but <laughs> it's my own life coaching program. I started uh, outside of Miraval. So mm. it's enlighten.com, E-N-L-I-H-T-E-N. It's a mm-hmm. old English spelling variation. Ah. So I take on new clients there. Um, I focus mostly with men, but I, I do keep my my scope open. Yeah. Oh, very good. Okay. Good to know that um, the listener, wherever they are around the world, that um, if this any part of this story or just your beingness resonates with them, that they could reach out to you. Um, okay. With that, Tyler, we're going to move into the final part of our show. It's the Life and Money Show Spotlight Round. We're going to ask you three right. questions we ask all our guests. You ready? I'm ready. Okay, great. The first question is around your life and money. So share with us one thing you're doing to live a meaningful and intentional life by design. Great question. So I never want to show up to a place I don't want to be at unless there's an absolute need to. Yeah. Uh, So I'm always intentional with where I show up and where I spend my time. If, you know, it's somebody saying, hey, let's go do this thing. And it's not something that resonates with who I am. I'm not going to just follow the crowd. Uh, Mm. So I, I want to be very intentional with my time, whether it's with my family, with my friends, with my work. Um, I'm, I'm going to make sure it's on my realm. Right? Yeah. That it's a full hundred percent. Yes. For you. That's, I love that, that if it's not, then, then it's not for you and the next opportunity will come, but then that reserves your time to fill up your own cup in ways that are more meaningful for you. And so I love that. I don't think anybody's ever said that. Um, on the show. So that's a really good one. Simple, but not always easy to follow through with to maintain those boundaries. And it might sound a little selfish, but you know, that's okay. Yeah. (laughs) But that's, I mean, at the end of the day, there's nothing I'm learning. There's nothing wrong with being selfish because you got to take care of yourself. That's right. And that's one thing horses are very good at doing. (laughs) Mm. (laughs) All right. Second question is about others' life and money. So share with us one life or money hack. By hack, we loosely mean a tip, a tool, a resource, a book, anything that's really helped you on your journey that you think might help the listener as well. Yeah. So I would always say pay attention to your judgments of other people Mm. or even of yourself. Because your judgments of other people are actually something you don't like or see within yourself. And that's a great opportunity to learn. You know, what is yeah. it that I'm judging this for this person for? And what does that say about me? Mm-hmm. So pay attention to your judgments. That's such a good one. You know, my one of my guilty pleasures that I've developed is um, watching The Bachelor and Bachelorette <laughs> shows with my mom. <laughs> Um, she absolutely loves them. And now they have the golden bachelor and golden bachelorette, which oh, are so much more amazing. I love them okay. way more because there's no fighting. There's no drama. They're just all supporting each other. And it's oh, man. The friendship together with the, it's, it's a great, it's a great, um, extension of the franchise. But anyway, I noticed over the years that as we would watch the show and my mom's English is her second language, um, but she's so she'd kind of get to know the people and she'd be like, who's that? Oh, that one, that one. I don't like her hair. And <laughs> I'd be like, Mom, what are you? And she was so critical about so many people that over time I started to, to try to open her up to see, you know, maybe you could have an, a little bit more of an open mind because those judgments that you're making about them, those are the same voices that are inside your head about yourself. And it was such a big lesson for me to learn and to be mirrored to me through my mom. And now I'm glad to say as we watch, it's much quieter. But once in a while, (laughs) she's still like that one, they should go home. I don't like that one. Um, (laughs) It's funny how we'll judge her for judging, right? (laughs) Right? I know. Yeah, totally. I love the saying, it's my perception of you that's a reflection of me. Yeah, 100%. Oh, that's a good one. Okay, final question is around life and money and the world. So 
share with us one thing that you're doing to help make the world a better place, whatever that means for you. I mean, I'd like to think the work that I do with people and horses is making ripple effects and not just their lives, but the people around them. And if they're more compassionate to themselves, more compassionate with everybody else. So I'd like to think that's how I'm making an impact on the world. But yeah. outside of that, my daughter and I like to go pick up trash. So that's, that's another thing. Yeah. That's great. I once when I was in uh, third grade, my my friend and I started a trash pickup um, club. We were living in New Jersey at the time. So as you can imagine, there was a lot of trash. Uh, yeah. We had shopping carts full of trash. And uh, but yeah, that's a that's a great way because, you know, nobody's well, not enough of us, I should say, are taking care of Mother Earth the sure. way that we should. Um, so that's beautiful. And also I think I take so much inspiration from the work that you do because, um, you know, for a long time, especially in my young adulthood, I think this was my ego speaking was I'm going to make something big. I'm going to have an impact on, I'm going to change the world and I'm going to become a household name. I'm going to make a name for myself. I'm going to create something big. And I did start going down that path. And I think I'm at a point now, now that I'm 40, I'm rethinking all of that. And I'm thinking, you know, is that really the life that I want? And what does impact really mean to me? And if I can just touch somebody in a meaningful way and uplift them and help them or help them see something in a different way or open up some small thing that they've been stuck on, that's, you know, that's what impact means to me now. And you're right, that ripple effect, I had discounted that before, but it just, when they go back into their communities and their friendships and their families, some small change could change everything. Um, and then that ripples out and ripples out. So I think that's beautiful. And I can certainly relate to you in that. I want to make something big, something great. Yeah. Something yep. that makes me stand out. Right. <laughs> that was yep. for me. Yes, exactly. All right, Tyler. Well, this has been a beautiful conversation, and I'm sure that many of our listeners may want to follow up with you, learn more either about coaching with you or through about the experience at Miraval. So tell them if they wanted to follow up or if they wanted to learn more, where can they go? Yeah. So I have an email, tyler at enlighten.com. So T Y L E R at E-N-L-I-H-T-E-N dot -E com. It's a, it's okay. a good way to get a hold. Fantastic. All right. Well, Tyler, uh, this has been fantastic. Thank you so much. Tyler Thompson, certified life coach at Enlighten and equine facilitator and supervisor at Miraval, Arizona. Tyler, thank you so much for sharing your wisdom and just your knowing and your way of being with us here today. Of course. Thanks for having me on. It's been a pleasure.